Hey, welcome to this episode of Hollywood Breaks, a special episode where we talk about the Oscars, what it means to us and our culture, and we pick winners, our favorites, and other conversations. So welcome to this episode and enjoy the show. Hey, I want to talk to you guys about the Oscars, obviously, oh. coming up in a couple of days, <laughs> I know. But before we dive into it, I read a New York Times article this morning about oh, yes. the the death of Hollywood is probably how I would summarize it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, again, sometimes I feel like when we're totally in sync with in the world, don't you Keith, where some people are like saying the same things we're saying on this podcast of there's definitely something that's changed. There's a shift that's taking place. Mm -hmm. um, but the author uh, Ross was basically kind of putting out there that the shift in Hollywood is reflective in the Oscars. So people's lack of attention for the Oscars is kind of the same shift of what's happening in the theaters and, and what have you. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit different perspective on that, but I'm kind of curious if you guys were to compare the state of the industry or kind of like where you think Hollywood is and the Oscar show that we're about ready to dive into, do you think there's a correlation to what the audience is for both of those? Uh... Well, this is what I would say about the article. So Roth Douthout, I always butcher his name, um, wrote a book, as you and I have talked about a lot, Tim, called The Decadent Society. And the essential thesis of it is like culturally, we're burned out. We're lazy. We don't want to push anymore. So we're just basically rehashing things over, making twinks, uh, tinkers around the edges. Like, you know, how many, how many iPhones do we need? But it's not really improving on the iPhone. It's just the same thing over and over again. You know, the nostalgia factor of all the movies that are being remade, all this stuff. So the, the thrust of his article is basically the Oscars have been sort of declining for years. And that's because movies, as we know it, have been declining for years. Um, his, you know, basically there's a lot of movies that are nominated this year, like King Richard, um, West Side Story, Dune, all sort of big pop culturally films that you would normally expect to make tons of money they didn't um but again this is all with the COVID asterisk of course and you know he's basically saying that the oscars are failing because movies are failing and i don't i i take a different perspective much like you do tim i think what's happening is the industry itself has survived several attempts to destroy it i.e vhs um tv uh, Robin, I don't know if you remember this presentation that Jim Giannopoulos gave shortly after he took over at Fox, and he literally threw up the headlines that said, the industry's <laughs> done, it's over, blah, 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 over. blah. And that, yeah, and then it literally showed the dates, and it was like the date when nice. television came along, and then yeah. when VHS yeah. came along, and then when DVD mm -hmm. came along. So it's just like, oh, we've been down this road before, we don't need to change anything. Yeah. But now I think the realization is we do need to change things. And I think the industry is sort of like tinkering around the edges versus diving in. And I think what, how we define movies sort of is in the nineties when it was sort of like the heyday of Titanic and Gladiator and into the two thousands and these sort mm -hmm. of epic cultural movies may be waning. But right. I, I think the reality is that unless things change and change is made from a like sort of uh, you know, the theatrical experience, the Oscar show itself, all these things. And if they just keep tinkering around the edges, then yeah, movies are toast. I mean, I think they'll always be Yeah, relevant. Robin, the title of the article is, we aren't just watching the decline of the Oscars, we're watching the end of the movies. Mm -hmm. um, so, and he, you know, genuinely, I think he is addressing some of the same items we address on the podcast, mm -hmm. which is there is a shift in viewership there is a shift in technology, but even a shift in desire of how we consume content. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, I think there's, there's so much to talk about there. And it's like almost like three separate things, the decline of movies, decline of Oscars, but they all are interwoven together. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about decline of movies as it relates to Oscars um, just for the sake of time. It's like, if you look at, the movies over the past decade um, or even 20 years, like you look at the past movies for the past 20 years and the movies that were nominated for best picture and how, you know, Keith, you mentioned it, they used to be like the Titanics of the world and even the avatars of the world. And then it started to 
the movies that started to be nominated were movies that people weren't even able to see if you didn't live in LA and New York. And they were in, available in limited release only until after the Oscars. And then all the people could watch them once, you know, there was demand for that movie. Once they went, oh, what's, what's this little movie Juno that everybody's talking about that's only available in LA and New York. And oh, let's re-release it after the Oscars now that, you know, it has all this attention. And, and that, I, I think that already kind of shows where Hollywood was, you know, I don't think they intended to do this and nobody intends to do this. It all comes from money. So in the beginning it was like, oh, we don't want to spend the money to release this movie in a wide release theater because no one is going to see it. And we're also a small, you know, distributor. We don't have the money to do a wide release kind of campaign. Um, so, you know, you kind of have to do it that way to save money. I get it. But that alone is kind of setting it up for once those become the definition, the new definition of art, right? The new definition of what a good movie is, um, it, you're not even, the wide audience isn't even able to see that. They're not even able to until after it's yeah. getting all that attention. So you're already kind of prioritizing the audience and not even realizing that you're doing that. And if you ask the audience like, what the best movie was from this year, um, as it relates to box office, it would be Spider-Man, easily. That's, that's exactly one of his year. points is like all yeah. these yeah. revered movies, but we're not actually addressing what people went to the theaters to watch. Right. People went to the theaters right. to watch Spider-Man, and yet there was a three-hour movie about people driving each other in a car. <laughs> like that doesn't, <laughs> nobody, I didn't even know right. the movie existed. No I one's even one watching piece. these movies. Like, yeah. so you look, if, do you want, so then as it relates to Oscars, like, if you want ratings, then people need to be able to see the movies so that they have something to root for. And yeah. people aren't yeah. watching the movies, so they don't really care to watch the Oscars anymore. And it, it, you can't, if you, if you want both, you have to have both. And if you actually look at the Oscar ratings, when they had the highest ratings over the past 20 years, you'll see that movies that were in the best picture race, there were more that were over a hundred million in box office. And it's a lot harder to measure now when you've got Netflix and Apple and Disney and there's no transparency in terms of viewership. So we don't really know. We kind of know, we know what they tell us. You know, we see Encanto come out and they talk about how many times people are rewatching it, which I completely believe because I think my daughter is, you know, takes for like 30 million of those maybe, give or take. <laughs> I believe that there are other families out there who are watching that, but you know, it's, it's, I mean, that's what we're dealing with now. Um, well, and I'll tell you from, from my point of view is, is I think the movies, the Juno movies of the world do, do still exist. And we actually <laughs> do watch them and consume them, but there's mm -hmm. something unusual about our consuming habit that's changing our perspective of if it's a movie or not. Mm. So I do watch content on a regular basis that is pretty amazing or create, creates a, a dialogue or has opportunity for you know a different worldview. That, that's pretty awesome. But sometimes when I'm watching it, it's on a platform that I don't feel like I went to the theaters to watch. And then that mm -hmm. theatrical items are ones that I feel like are appealing to you, like the Spider-Mans and, and animated films or whatever, where it's supposed to be like a group think moment. And, and maybe so the evolution isn't in the creators necessarily, but it's in the consumers. And then when you say, hey, let's make an award show about it, you're like, well, what, what's qualified and what's not anymore? Yeah. So then well, you're I like, oh, now, now you go like, oh, this foreign film about a chauffeur and a, you know, an artist being driving around. You're like, OK, well, I guess that's relevant because the platform allows for this very wide range nowadays. And just because I haven't seen it because it didn't fall into a, a technological filter that is uh -huh. transferred to me that gives me access to films, mm -hmm. that the evolution of my consuming habit is somewhat changing. Well, I, another thing I think, I think there's two things going on here. One, it's a cultural thing. We can't agree on anything anymore. Like if you think back to when like Titanic won Best Picture and you know, Are you just setting that, us up for this, the rest of the no, show, Keith, right no. here by saying we don't agree on anything anymore? <laughs> yeah, well, I, what I'm saying is culturally, like, we can't agree on much of anything anymore. Yeah. So how are we going to agree on what constitutes a good movie, right? Like, we just can't, we, you know, and everyone, no one really, tr there's no trust anymore. 
And, you know, there's, we talk a lot about sort of the lack of trust in sort of storied institutions. Well, Hollywood is one of those storied institutions and a vast majority of the public does not trust anything coming out of Hollywood. And I think that it's harder to do that with a comic book movie than it is to do with a movie about someone being dri driven around all day, right? Um, and the second thing that I think is going on, and this is a big pet peeve of mine, is what is a movie? Like we have not yeah. really sort of set that definition and the Academy, which is a, a motion picture arts and sciences, which is the entire title is supposed to, de to defend the movie. But what did they do? They said, no, two weeks, you're fine. New York or LA and you're a movie. Well, yeah, Robin's ready to jump in, in here. I can see she's like. <laughs> that. I mean, that's why I, 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 look, I don't think, I think a movie can be a movie as long as it's for somebody and uh, like that doesn't bother me and like the love academy that. what's that yeah as long as it's for somebody i love as that long as it's caveat. for somebody right yeah and um look i i think you know it all comes back to it, you touched on it keith i think and it was this whole idea of like the culture wars and how we can't agree on anything anymore and i think a big part of the disconnect between hollywood and audiences has become this like Nobody wants to be preached to, whether it's in their Oscar acceptance speeches or even in the movies themselves, people are feeling like they're being preached to because so many of the movies have a political agenda or a social commentary. Like there's few movies that are just, you know, th that are just for everyone now. There's a lot of the movies have a specific audience that is targeting a specific culture. And it's like, you know, I, I think a big part of it is you look at last year's Oscars, right? Which was like abysmal uh, ratings, 10, what, 10 million, 10.4, 10. Yeah. 10 I think yeah. more 10, people watch Super Bowl commercials than watch right. the Oscars. <laughs> right. But it's not surprising to me. And it wasn't just because of the movies. It was also, we were in a global pandemic. Like it was tone deaf. They should never have done the Oscars last year. And what they should have done is, I, look, I get that, you know, they should have scrapped the show, but they didn't want to do that. And I get that there's, there's talent and directors and people who deserve to be recognized for the movies that they did that year. I absolutely agree with that. But at the same time, like, yeah, it like, yeah. it sucks to scrap it, but guess what? Then it just sucks for those people. Like, I'm sorry, it sucks for you guys. Let's roll it, in, let's figure out another solution. Let's roll it into next year's uh, Academy or let's just do like scrap the show, take that money and put it towards something that matters right now. How about COVID relief. Need. Right, take like a telephone or something. Matters. And then, like, then it sucks for you guys. I'm sorry, but instead, it uh, was like, no, we're going to prioritize these few people, and it's going to suck for everybody else. And that's what happened. Like, they yeah. prioritized Hollywood instead of instead well, of doing. So, are we ready for the where... the reboot? Then, I like they're obviously trying to. There's been a lot of PR around the the three hosts of the show. There's a lot of. PR around the opportunity that having the change of the format so that we're looking at a kind of different show or kind of highlighting only the items that matter. But well, I, I'll, look, I'll say I like, we either. all admit at least that we're, I'm a fan of the Oscars. I'm going to watch it regardless. I do anyway. I don't know. It's just kind of what I've I been do doing too. for 30 right. something years. Yeah. I think what, what they did is, I mean, look, the press that they're getting on that um, you know, you, you take away the Academy and you look at it from a, a far distant standpoint of what it was in, originally intended to do. And it's to celebrate the art of making movies. You can't take away that from people and decide what you think is worthy of time. I think that's a pretty shitty thing to do, honestly. And the only people who are paying attention and the only people who care are, are people who are already going to watch the Oscars anyway people in the industry, nobody on the outside cares. They're not going to be like, oh, they're taking out, you know, I heard they're taking out editing this year. So let's watch. They don't care. <laughs> they're not going to, they don't, they're not going to watch. Robin, you're never going to be able to hire care. another editor again. Well, that's, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. No, I'm saying like, that's the right. whole point. I don't know who the editor was the anyway. I don't relate to them. Yeah. Yeah. That's removing that's the presentations of those doesn't, is not going to improve viewership. It's not like that. All it's going to do is piss off the people 
who worked very hard on these movies, who should be recognized. I think there's other creative ways that the Academy could have addressed the situation. And it all comes back to also like what the definition of art is. If you want better ratings, then recognize the movies that audiences are watching. Otherwise you're gonna deal with the ratings that you have, right? Yeah. Like, that that's kind of what it is. Like I don't mm -hmm. And don't that, worry, it is art it. and science too. I mean, when you take out yeah. the technical side, you're kind yeah. of pushing it to, hey, it's really about the red carpet. Matter of fact, why do they just broadcast yeah. the red carpet and leave the rest of it behind closed doors? That <laughs> might be just fun. All right, let's well, get to the show a little bit. Let's get to the I show. I used to do that. They used to just be in a ballroom, and then they would just announce them. And Keith, on, that was a long time ago. Running. You might have I been know. alive back then, but I was. the Shirley Temple days are way behind us. Do you know what, like the most interesting thing to me was like last year, when you look at the Oscars, nobody remembers anything about the Oscars and like their acceptance speeches, nobody cares. And it was, it, it, what they should have done is scrapped it, like I said, and then just had acceptance speeches online and made it a publicity stunt to use that money and put it towards something good that helps everybody. Like that would have been a real, that would have gone a long way with audiences in Hollywood, I think. But also like the thing that stands out to me the most of what people paid attention to and what went viral was like, when Jason Sudeikis was accepting his award in a tie-dye shirt and like people cared about that because he was real because he was like the rest of us he wasn't in a room you know breaking protocol like everybody else was right like yeah right doing... how funny <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying like this is where the, this is where there's a disconnect with audiences in Hollywood I mean it's the same thing when you start seeing all the headlines like what gets the press is oh they're not they don't have to mask up and we're not going to check if they're vaccinated and like you know you're gonna get you're gonna get people talking about that that might be before the vaccinations i don't know i can't remember what the schedule i can't remember timelines anymore i'm no, talking I about think... now i'm talking <clears throat> about oh, yeah. now now well yeah i mean the press whatever that you're getting on you the know. outside that aren't you know industry people that's the press that the oscars is getting and that's not right. good that's not good you know what so, I, I do appreciate though is it's still like a center of a cultural event. Even if no one's watching it, people are talking about not watching it, which kind of goes mm -hmm. to show you that we still care about it. We we want something that's yeah. different. Um hey, let's yeah. talk about the best picture nominees because there's a, there's a wide range that's kind of being chosen. I think extending the best picture to I think it's 10 slots now. It's very interesting. I'm sure the vote, it changes all voting protocol when you're voting for out of, you know, the best out of 10, you get a, it's probably not a maximum number of votes. And I think that shifts a lot of the outcome of it. It's ranked um, choice voting. But do you guys have a list in front of you? There's a, I mean, there's a lot yeah, to, to go through here. I have it. Um, I but let's just yeah. kind of walk through what our best ideas are. You know, we have Nightmare Alley, which is Guillermo del Toro and very visually appealing, you know, great storytelling, interesting opportunity. Don't look yeah. up that kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, Netflix movie. Uh, Dune, if you've been watching this podcast, you know my opinion, Dune, incredible film. He did an amazing job. Overall picture is just wonderful visually storyline. Drive My Car, which you know to me is the one that I am least familiar with, but I know it's like mm -hmm. a personal relationship film, which I appreciate there's something in there of saying, hey, let's, there's more about more to filmmaking than just the visual appeal. Belfast, Kenneth Branagh's biopic, um, love mm -hmm. that one. And the, the child actor in there is really great. The Chris Pizza, uh, PTA, and another one of his great films, Power of the Dog, very actor-centric uh, film. And we kind of know all the press around that. West Side Story, have no idea why this is even on this list at all. Spielberg, King Richard. That's why. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Just kidding on that one a little bit. Uh, best, uh, King Richard, which is a Will Smith uh venture there um i thought he did a great job of getting that done and then coda uh, which we'll I'll talk to you about coda in a second when i express who i think should win best picture but let's hear what you guys are thinking what's which one are I you mean, guys thinking we can go through each one i think uh he started off with nightmare alley um look guillermo is fantastic i think he's so cinematic and he's one of those directors who you just know who you're watching as soon as you turn it on because his aesthetic, like he's very, it reminds me of like a Baz Luhrmann or, um, yeah. you know, like, like as soon as you see it, you know who yeah. it is, who's behind it. And I think there's something really special about that. And, and, and that's what set that movie apart for me. The movie itself um, was dark. It was interesting. It was good. I, I, yeah. I thought it was fine. But so cinematic. I mean, that is a so, theatrical yeah. experience 
through and through. Yeah. Such yeah. a great. It was, it was yeah. long um, and slow at times, but uh, it was still beautiful. There's a great story there and wonderful acting. And again, the world that he created, I thought was awesome. Um, what was it? West Side Story. Let's touch on that. I know how you guys feel about it. I've been listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, look, I'm not, here's what I'll say to you guys. Expectation is the root of all heartache. And I think you guys went in with huge expectations and rightfully so it's Steven Spielberg on one of the most perfect, uh, you know, movies arguably uh, ever. And uh, so I think everyone's going to go in with high expectations, but I actually, I actually liked the movie, but I was a theater major. So, it, you know, it was I, by the way, I, I was oh, a theater major. I could appreciate uh, yeah. theater. Um, but, you know, I, I think, I liked it because it just felt like a love letter to the original. And uh, and that's good. That was good enough for me. But Do best I picture, Robin, come on. Come this on, is- no. well, well, hold on. So uh, look, it's Steven. So that's why he's getting nominated for it. But, but here's what I would say. If it wasn't Steven doing that movie and somebody else delivered the exact same movie, I actually think the press would be all, people would be so amazed by it. Like, so I think because it's Steven, <clears throat> there's high expectation there. And again, like it's because he is, I mean, he is, there's what other director, there isn't one who he is bigger than the movies he makes. He is. Like even Yeah, James but I Cameron wish Kenneth Branagh would have directed West Side Story because is. Kenneth Branagh has a better, kind of a better visual eye and a better understanding of storytelling. And I just oh, felt well. like the whole movie was, I don't, I don't think it just I, didn't. I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I totally so get it. And it's, it, you know, but I, I, I actually thought there were some really beautiful scenes and like the scene when they're in the dance and like, I really enjoyed, you know, all the color and all the, I mean, the dance sets were amazing. Um, but yeah, I agree. It didn't add that best. much. The word best means think about your, yeah, like Nightmare Alley. No, I don't think it was the best and it's not my favorite. It's so what's your favorite. best? But I didn't what's your best? Yeah. And what's I your do best? want to say one thing, Ariana, oh, yeah. uh, Ariana DeBose is like, she should win and she, she stole the movie. Win. And I also think that if Hollywood, you know, if she's the future of Hollywood, then we're in good hands because that girl is like, she's the triple threat. She is what, she reminds me of old Hollywood, like Fred Astaire and, um, you know, uh, Jane Russell, like these people who were, who could do everything. Like she is, she is amazing. Huge yeah. fan. I hope she wins. Um, sorry, I digress. No. Yeah, I which film, what is which film would be yours choice then? Yeah. Well, what, yeah, which one do you think is going to win? Or should um, we go by what are, what your favorite is? I have two favorites. And uh, so I will say my favorite was Coda. Like, but yes. my, my Robin. aunt is deaf. So I'm biased also, but like, so it also was very personal for me. It felt that way to me, but I just thought the movie was, uh, it, it was brilliant. Like it was beautiful. It was about family, about sacrifice. It's, it was a movie that we need right now, uh, as a nation. I actually, I absolutely, you know, it felt real and human. I and, totally agree. Yeah. Um, for and me, like what I liked is characters that that's it. It's a, it's a it's a connection to other people that I don't necessarily have exposure to. Yeah. And they told me a story about their life, and I, I, I know it's fictional, but like there is a great like connection that I had. Films have that ability to introduce right. you to a different world. Yeah. Such a great job, and uh, yeah. you know, honestly, it's like very sweet, very straightforward. Oh. It's a it's a good film. It's uh, a right. sound and everything. Well, Keith has Coda and uh, and then I loved Belfast and um, I thought Belfast was um, special and I think like when you talk about making movies for somebody um, I mean look he defined it like for uh, was it for the ones who stayed for the ones who left and for the ones we lost and I just thought like the music was I mean I love Van Morrison too but um, like uh, it was like another character in the movie. It was so beautifully shot. The acting was gorgeous. Like to me, I want Kenneth Branagh to win best director. I mm -hmm. think it was like wholly original. And um, I just, I absolutely loved it. Yeah. And right, I right also would you. say if the Academy, I mean, everyone keeps talking about the Academy going for uh, a streamer this year, but if the Academy, you know, 
doesn't want to do that, I could see Belfast pulling through and actually taking best picture because of that reason, because the Academy's reluctant to give it to a streamer. Sure. Mm. All right, Keith, what do you got? Well, all right. I have to confess, I have not seen all of them. Um, I've only seen like three or four, well, three of them, I think. So I can't really weigh in sort of in the quality, but what I will do since you two sort of tackled that aspect of it, I'll tackle the ones that I, the one I think is going to win. And I, I think it's going to be Coda um, because two reasons. One, they won uh, the SAG award, which for those of you who don't know, I believe, and I think this is still true, although they've changed the numbers on membership the acting branch is the largest branch voting branch of the academy so if they win the award that usually leans things their direction and then it also took the pga award for best picture producers guild so right now all the momentum is behind um coda so but as robin said the x factor is will the academy finally give it to a streamer um i think that ship has sailed and i think now the streamers are part of the academy um as i said earlier the two-week release that's all they have to do to qualify so they're they're as academy standards they're considered a movie so i think i think coda's got a shot now is a upset possible absolutely and i think robin makes a great point about belfast uh, i think that one's definitely up there um and then obviously there's the power of the dog, although that has been waning in the, in the last few weeks. Uh, I think Oscar voting closed on Tuesday. So mm -hmm. the momentum was leaning towards Coda. Like, like I said, they won the SAG, they won the PGA. So I think right now it, the, it's in Coda's favor. I think it also may be that if we're gonna get political about it, that the Academy won't wanna stick it to Netflix because they feel that Ted Sarandos has been chasing an Oscar for like, since they started releasing movies. And I think there's a little bit, even though Apple and Netflix kind of have been spending the same amount of money in terms of promoting their awards, promoting their movies, there's still this sense that Netflix is just a machine and they just want that gold statue for their lobby. And that's all they care about. Whereas, you know, Apple just, you know, Tim Cook just floats down from Cupertino and is like, oh, yes, I will pay 30 million for this. Thank you. And then just throws it up on his own. I like how floats and... in your world. All right. So here, <laughs> well, I, uh, well, I appreciate know, both you guys. It's got all the money in the world. So anyway, <laughs> I appreciate both that because I, but I'll say one is I also think Coda should win Best Picture. Obviously, I've already expressed that. There's something that they did so well. And I, Robin, I'm with you, Belfast. Um, I just would echo the same thing you're saying. So no reason to repeat it. I find it interesting, though, in Coda, that even while watching it, sometimes I know I'm watching a Netflix movie or sometimes I know I'm watching an Amazon movie. When I was watching this, I, it took me, I, I had to almost remind myself, oh yeah, Apple did this. And yeah. I would remind us- They that bought it. Apple, they bought it. They bought, they bought it. it. You no, know, but it was released by them, right? I know like, that's what- Yeah, but that's a well, big difference Well, at their though. studio that they purchased things, that's fine. That's a big difference though, because you're talking sure. about, net, you know a Netflix movie because I know how much you love the quality of Netflix movie. They shot the power, they paid for the power of the dog. That wasn't an acquisition. Sure. Apple swooped in on at the Sundance, virtual Sundance and just said, we want this and they can you blame them though the movies no fantastic. it's incredible i don't yeah, blame they them won. Uh, no, and i'll saying... say you know you gotta remember that they did release inconvenient truth like don't forget apple has been a player in films since that like they're not outside of that the studio space and studio thinking right. um but I, i'll say this and you know how much i love netflix you know netflix yeah. actually is doing something different what i don't like about netflix is they making a bunch of content that's just consumable they turned it content into a consumable commodity and i think that's hurtful to the industry but they have been backers of some pretty amazing talent and mm -hmm. creators and when they put their effort behind it which i think power of the dog was something they tried to actually say hey let's think differently about this they got a different result so there is something about what netflix is doing strategically that makes yeah. me curious about how they will evolve in their decision making over time and it might change my no nah, never mind it won't change anything about them. <laughs> All right, let's go to a uh, best uh, uh actor just for this because uh i do want i want to say okay. something about power sure. of the dog though because everyone's talking about it and i do think it's important to there were there's a couple things with that movie it's like and i i sent this to keith while you're talking on the phone or texting i think a few 
I don't know, a week ago or something. Yeah. Um, and after I saw the movie, I, again, I went in with super high expectations because everybody's loving and loving this movie. But to me, Power of the Dog was, it was so beautifully shot, right? Like everything that you see is gorgeous. And, but here was my problem with that. And, and it was none of those beauty shots moved the story forward. I know. Right. Yeah. And so I had um, zero connection with any of the characters. I didn't, I was not emotionally invested in any one of them. And like, to me, a great director is someone who can connect all those dots. Right. And so you take someone like a Tony Scott, who every single shot is deliberate and nothing's wasted. And, or, you know, you look at the Copacabana scene in Goodfellas, like, I know that's the, the quintessential one that everybody talks about, but there's a reason for it. Like you go, you show up to the, or you, they show up to the Copacabana, Karen's standing there and there's a huge line and he's like, let's go around the kitchen. And he takes her through the kitchen. He knows every single person down there. He's high-fiving people. And she's just like, oh my God, they, it's one camera shot. It's yeah. brilliant. One and take, then yeah. they go, they work their way through the crowd. They set up a table that doesn't even exist for him in the very front of the show. And he slips someone a 20 all to serve the next line. And the purpose of Karen saying, what do you do? Like, which is like, that's, that to me is proper, beautiful direction. And I, I you know, like, I don't want to crap all over Jane. Like she's, she made beautiful, beautiful scenery, but I wasn't connected to it the way that I wanted to. And Robin, um, but you're bringing up some some pretty great points in that. One is I do feel like it was created by AI. I mean, the the way the shots were programmed, <laughs> that that the subject is programmed. They're like, oh, this is what when Academy Awards we're going to have our subjects be like. They just like basically looked at data to determine how to make a movie, and they made the yeah. film by data. But the totally. difference between the movies that you brought up, the Tony Scott films, the Goodfellas is those were shot on film. That one shot is so complex because there's a finite amount of material in a canister that as they walk through it, there's a timing that, that's set up and the cost of that shot. So the complexity <clears throat> to pull that off technologically is so great that it was every shot had a purpose. Today, you know, digital filmmaking allows for just a whole bunch of stuff to be captured. So we're no longer drawn into that if they don't have that purpose behind it. So you right, really and I do want to say this there. too about Power of the Dog, which is like from an audience perspective and consumption in terms of like what the stories are that people are liking to see. I don't want to take away from the story. It was important to tell, and and I, you know it is what it was. But like one of the things that I really want to fight for in when we see these kind of movies is like what it's not a comp at all, but it serves my purpose of telling this, which is Shit's Creek. I want to see more healthy LGBTQ <laughs> relationships. No, for real. Like I instead love it. of it's so smart. It's but so it's smart. true. Like once we yeah. see, we keep seeing this story again and again of someone who's in the closet and it's toxic masculinity and he's scared to come out and he's ashamed. And the more the tent, the intent I know is to do the opposite, but I think that it's kind of reinforcing that. People should be ashamed, and I'm I'm done with that now. I want to see healthy, normal LGBTQ relationships because they exist, and that's more important to me now to see, and I think more important to the gay community, and that's something that I think that we should be showing more of. Yeah, than playing up the taboo of it, right? Yeah, the taboo yeah. conversation has to be over. All right, let's get to the best already. actor because we're. We can talk about this all day, but we do yeah. probably have a real time limit yeah. uh, Sorry. to this thing. Go on. All right. So uh, there are five great actors uh, nominated here Andrew Garfield for Tick, Tick, Boom, Benedict Cumberbatch for The Power of Dog. I talked about that. Javier Bardem for Being the Ricardos, I think, which, which is a great film. Denzel Washington for The Tragedy of Macbeth, which, if you ask me, the tragedy there is we're not talking about it. Such a great mm. shot, great moment film. And then finally, Will Smith for King Richard. You're gonna to have to pick one because we have one more to topic we want to talk about, which is actress. So, uh, who's gonna go first, Keith? Why don't you go first? Who's your actor pick? I think this one's probably gonna be Will Smith. Really? Um, okay. Yeah, I just think uh, he's taken every other award up to this point, um, and I just think it feels like that's that's where the momentum's going. I do have kind of a bone to pick with it because my my big thing has always been 
you know, if you're, when you give a trophy for best actor, it should be someone who imagines the character out of the blue. Like they look at a page on the screen and they create a character. Will Smith, you know, he did do a very good job, but at the same time, he was imitating someone who actually lived. So he had something to work off of. And I feel like someone who creates a character out of nothing, like deserves a um, dessert, like that, de- like de- well, listen, Macbeth's been done a million times, but still, <clears throat> you know, that that is a the way that performance is delivered from the, the clips that I've seen and everything like that. That's a, it, it elevates the craft. Whereas I feel like Will Smith is basically he watched a lot of 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 footage of Richard Williams and kind of captured his cadence and his movement and all that kind of stuff. And just which is Will Smith's it. brilliant, right? Pursuit of happiness and Ali. Like he does a great job of embodying yeah. the character. He's, he's very playing. good at doing that. And but you, it's very he portrays it very well. You you don't but ever again, feel like you're watching Will my Smith. My thing is like character. if you're gonna give it an award, it should be for someone who imagines right, it that's takes fair. the anyway. how about you, Robin? What's yours pick? I mean, I think this year, I think it belongs to Will. I think it's Will's to lose. Um, although I could see Andrew Garfield sneaking in there and mm. uh, getting some attention for Tick, Tick, Boom because he's awesome. I mean, he's so good. He's so good in everything he does. Um, but it was kind of this uh, amazing performance that, uh, you know, really, the same thing though. I mean, he, to Keith's point, he's, imitating somebody else but kind of everybody is whether it's being the ricardos or you know yeah they all are in in this particular set yeah and and that doesn't bother me as much i just think to me it's either will or andrew for best actor robin it's almost like we shared notes i'm with you i think andrew garfield is my pick he's the one i to to watch him pull that character off and all the different talent he has to had to put together to pull that character off for the film was great the directing was really great for him um, yeah. I don't know if I'm responding to the the big push, but I the Benedict Cumberbatch, I know that he probably deserves some credit for it, but I felt like I've just been force fed saccharin of his character for for months now, trying to get this Oscar to him that I think it did him a disservice. Um, yeah, but I, 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 I think, think Will Smith really- is just being Will Smith. I I think he that's the how he acts, and those are the characters we're always going to see him step up in. It's either that, or we're going to see him play Fresh Prince on. Because that's the other other character he plays in films is right the one where he's the Will Smith dude, bad yeah. boys guy doing his thing, right. uh, Men in Black thing. Or we're going to see him actually reenact somebody. And I think right. he did a great job of stepping in there. And again, like I wasn't, I was watching, um, you know, the, uh, the not Will Smith, but the person he was portraying the entire time, which was really great. Mm. Okay, actress, ready? Jessica Chastain, Eyes of Tammy Faye, Olivia Coleman, The Lost Daughter. Kristen Stewart, Sir Spencer, Nicole Kidman, being the Ricardos, and Penelope Cruz, Mattress Parallels. I got I don't know, Madrid Parallel Paralese. Mothers, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's Parallel Mothers. But, yeah, I should learn. <laughs> All right, Robin, this one's yours. Which one we're we going to uh, pick here? Best Actress. Um, It's tough. I mean, look, I think it's probably Jessica Chastain's. Um, it, it, I think it's hers to lose this year. Yeah. Um, I think... I mean, look, for me, I wanted Katrona Balfe. I, I don't know if I'm saying her name right, but the woman from Belfast that who wasn't even nominated, like she was <laughs> someone who I thought should be there, but um, more so than others. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's going to be Jessica. I think that, you know, Olivia is amazing in everything she does, but I don't know that the Academy is going to do it, you know, so quick or so close to when she just received an award. Um, unfortunately, I don't know that they think that way, but they might, right? So um, I think it's going to be probably Jessica Chastain. Jessica, yeah. How about you, Keith? Uh, I think that's probably correct, but I, I feel like Penelope Cruz might come out and sneak it away. I Is haven't seen that. Amazing. I haven't Is seen it-, it either, but I've read a lot of really raving press about her in that role. And, you know, I don't know. I just, I, I, you're right. The momentum is definitely towards Jessica and it feels like it's hers to lose, but I think Penelope has a really good shot at being a surprise. Okay. Um, I I think it's Jessica Chastain too, just because of the press that she's getting. I think she's going to win. Um, I'll say, I'll, I'll speak like, I wish, I, Kristen Stewart, I'm sure she's great in Spencer, but I just don't know if I, I think that's the lost nomination to your point, uh, Robin, and, and the actress from Belfast should have easily stepped in there more easily. 
um, there is such a great connection she had to the character she was playing and you know to watch someone play uh, 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 what's her name uh, um, who did she play in Spencer uh, Diana Diana, Diana, thank you. Diana. <laughs> I was like I, I had the other queen in my head Princess Diana yeah. but here's one thing that I found interesting and I'd point out both Javier Bardem and Nicole Kidman both got nominated for being the Ricardos which is interesting to me because the movie is really great and kind of shows this how that movie stepped up in an interesting way that both actors are being recognized for their roles too. So it gives an overall presence of really what being the Ricardos did. And they did, they were Lucy and Desi, I know that. And they're telling a basic story, but Aaron Sorkin's story and the way he, he told the story was really awesome. So um, I just love that they're being recognized for that. Do you, you guys want to do one more? Yeah. Sure, if we, we're not going too long. <laughs> best yeah. director. Time. We're good. Who wants uh, to do best director? Who wants to dive into best director here? I mean, I wish Denny was, uh, yeah. you know, was recognized in this Come category. On. <laughs> this like, is the one where Spielberg, I think. Yeah. Spielberg yeah. snuck in because he's Spielberg. Paul, also, Paul Thomas Anderson, who I love. Like, I didn't think Licorice Pizza was one of his special movies even like I didn't that I didn't connect with that movie as much like I felt like that movie was like you know American Graffiti and Days and Confused um adopted a baby they didn't have a baby right it wasn't their baby but they That's adopted, all adopted meaning, one. like it's not quite theirs but it has like, it's like raising Arizona content. meets <laughs> right. <laughs> right right but like that's what so it just didn't deliver for me um and whereas like Dune absolutely did. Uh, so I think, you know, miss. Denny got robbed out of that. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's an easy, easy, like give to Kenneth Branagh. Mm. Easily. I think the best direction of everyone who's nominated. Yeah, I agree. How about you, Keith? Well, I think uh, I would, I, I mean, listen, I, again, I haven't seen them all, so I can't qualify that, but I would say that it looks like, the, the Jane. momentum's Jane. Yeah, she I mean she won the DGA award. Usually that's a pretty good barometer of who's going to win best director. Yeah. So I have a feeling it's going to although she did make some rather uh disparate remarks towards Venus and Serena Williams yeah. during her acceptance speech which kind of dung, dinged her a little bit. So I don't know if that's Yeah, odd move there, right? Like, yeah, what you... really weird. I don't know why you get up there and just like, "Hey, by the way, I did this and you, you know, I was like, what 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 what, what why she said like, that? Also, here's the thing that's so funny about it. Like they were in the race for the same award. Like, like meaning that they're, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, yeah. it, to me, it's like, you know. I, I didn't get it either. With her. She, and it felt like wrong. she was just, she just was looking to be like, I don't know, poke somebody just, yes, exactly. Pat herself on the back a little bit and say, look at what, look at me. Um, yeah. But I think she's, I, I think she's got a really good shot. And, you know, given sort of the, identity politics era in which we currently live you know denying it to a very accomplished female director um i think would probably not go over well with the academy so i think they're probably going to give it to jane not that she doesn't deserve yeah, like, it in some so ways but and condescending as a woman that annoys me that because then that's well part. yeah i agree i, I totally get it because she's a woman whereas like i'm sorry i don't think that you know, and this is just my opinion. I know a lot of people disagree with me, but like uh, she didn't connect. It just felt like a bunch of scenes, really great scenes with actors, like, yeah. but none of them, they were like, none of them were interwoven together. It was just yeah. very. It felt like yeah. a bunch of vignettes put together. <laughs> yeah. With right, like again, an overarching... AI chose Jane yeah. Champion to be the that director was a, that because was a AI wonderful, said that would win that, was, uh, that analogy yeah. was spot on because that, <laughs> it, when you look back on it, you're like, wow. He's right. It does feel like an AI put together movie. Like they yeah. just fed it into the system and this is what sped up. Yeah. Like, but look, well, Netflix you guys know has like the best, uh, they have, you know, a whole awards division led by Lisa Tabak, who's one of the best yeah. in the business. Like, right. you know, it, she's, there's a reason why it's, it's being yeah. talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys know my, my choice for best director. It's Steven Spielberg. So we've talked ah! about that. You guys <laughs> That's my favorite. That's my pick, right? Cause I love me some Spielberg. <laughs> yeah. Leave Steven alone. I'm not. It's Leave not him. Steve. It's just that I don't understand why that film was made. It just is a replica of a 40 year old film without adding any new context. I feel like if you gave that to Kenneth Branagh, 
or our director that had a perspective, we would see today's world reflected in that storyline. And there I just I, felt like I don't I didn't even I didn't even feel nostalgia walking watching that film. I just felt <laughs> like I was watching a high school performance of Ooh. a famous musical re, redoing all the oh original boy. shots in the original form. Like I, like there was there was no reason for it. That's all. I might just I, turn off my camera on this one. I think Ron was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't look, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with that, but I don't um I don't have a problem with it. To me, like I said, it's just a love letter. It was just a love letter to the original. And if anyone can do that, it's Steven. To me, the but problem best, Robin, is that best. It, the word best means like they did Well, something. the problem with it is that um, they spent too much money on it, right? Like, because it didn't, it under delivered at box office. They didn't make money back in the long run. So it wasn't the best business decision, I don't think. Yeah. But like, I didn't, I, I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was a love letter. Like I said, I thought that the the dance sets and the dance set pieces were beautiful and amazing. So I, I know, I but that's what those should be. Why should, I mean, come on. That's, it's a, of course she's going to have a great dance in it. That's what the, it's a musical with dance in it. Well, Keith can't comment on this because uh, he always has a reputation with Spielberg from his fast <laughs> company. Uh, article he can't really mention Keith Spielberg no. again, but we know it. I, I think my feelings are well known at this point. <laughs> <laughs> all right listen we could do this forever but rob i could be living on here for three you hours on. can you come <laughs> back please sooner than later maybe we should uh do a recap of this i think in the next couple of weeks we have people stepping yeah. in but let's let's see how we our picks played out over time okay we, yeah. Uh, yeah that's a good idea i'll be back i'll come back and all we'll right. talk sweet all right good to see you guys this week hope a great weekend enjoy the show maybe we'll be texting each other halfway through we should make yeah sure please well, perhaps we will <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks guys thank you guys thank bye you. bye